Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And as promised on this Friday, I'm going to begin a review and a response to a book by uh, Kyle Pope, who is a Church of Christ minister. He wrote this book in 2019. It just recently came to my attention. Someone asked me if I'd seen it. Someone asked me if I'd respond to it. And I'm glad to do so. <clears throat> you know, <laughs> I've got a backlog of books on my desk here that people have asked me uh, to review and to respond to, and I apologize for not getting to some of them. Uh, it really is amazing how many times people write to me and say, oh, you gotta, you got to respond to this book, or you got to respond to that article, or you got to say something about this. But that's okay. I, I appreciate that. Anyway, the book is, as I said, Thinking About A.D. 70 by Kyle Pope. Now, the book is published by Truth Publications, uh, CEI Bookstore in Athens, Alabama. Uh, they have a website, which is www.truthbooks.com if you wish to find a copy of the book uh, and to read it. Now, I'm not going to cover a tremendous amount of territory this morning. This will be sort of kind of introductory remarks. Uh, the very first remark is really more style uh, and about journalism than, uh, and uh, it has nothing to do with exegesis. It is a little bit troubling, however. In the book, Mr. Pope mentions me several times and makes it a point of taking issue with things that I've said, which is just fine. Now, what is interesting to me and somewhat troubling is that although Mr. Pope mentions me several, several times in the book, when you go to his works cited, I don't appear, my name does not appear anywhere. Now, that's somewhat troubling because journalistic integrity, and I'm not impugning Mr. Pope at all. I'm just simply referring to the practice of journalism. Uh, but journalistic integrity, journalistic practice, let me put it like that, suggests and virtually demands if you're going to cite someone and if you're going to say, Don Preston says this, Don Preston wrote that, then journalistic practice virtually demands that you give the bibliographic reference. You give the name of the book, you give the publisher, and you give the page number. <clears throat> and yet, you find none of that in Mr. Pope's book when he cites me. Another troubling thing is that the single preterist book that he does seem to cite is by Tina Ray Collins in her book, The Gathering of the Last Days. Now, that book was published in 2012, and it's a good book, by the way. Uh, so I have no problem with that. I suppose the issue is, why, why does Mr. Pope give the bibliographic reference to Tina's book, but he gives whom he mentions very, very briefly, <clears throat> and yet he does not give any kind of bibliographic reference to my book? And let me make this observation. Tina Ray Collins wrote one book. So to my knowledge... I have written more books on fulfilled eschatology than anyone else. And yet my name does not appear in the works cited, even though Mr. Pope cites me over and over and over again. And what's interesting is <clears throat> he references my debate with Mr. Jason Wallace that I had in Salt Lake City some years ago, and yet... He does not even reference the fact that you can watch that debate on YouTube and give a link to that. Now, why would Mr. Pope cite my works, say, well, Preston says this and Preston says that, and not one time give a link to where you can find that quote, and not one time, uh, even though like on page 132, for instance, he says, in Preston's writings, 
he emphasizes the time statements about the coming of the Lord. Well, that's right, I do. So the question is, therefore, why does Mr. Pope, following good journalistic practice and decorum, why does he not give a single bibliographic reference to even one of my books in which I emphasize the importance of time statements? You know, to this date, I have written <clears throat> well over 30 books, and yet not a reference, unless I missed it, okay? But to this point, and it's certainly not in the works cited at all, why that silence? Could it be, posing a question here, could it be that Mr. Pope doesn't want his readers to know where they can get a hold of my books? Could it be that Mr. Pope doesn't want his audience to watch the debate with Mr. Wallace or my other debates that are posted on YouTube? Could it be that Mr. Pope knows that if his readers are exposed to the, to the writings which I have done, they may actually become convinced of covenant eschatology? Why do you hide a pretty vast array of information from your readers when journalistic practice would virtually demand that you give them the references that you are citing. Okay, enough of that. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Pope begins, the, begins his book by an examination, and the title, it's chapter 2, entitled The Song of Moses. And he says, one of the first Christians I met who accepted some of these views, i.e. preterism, my comment, believed strongly that the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 was a prophetic declaration that pointed specifically to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. While this is not a passage commonly incorporated into arguments used by preterists, there are some who draw the same conclusions, unquote. Well, first of all, let me make this observation. All of the leading preterists with whom I am familiar, and I think that I know the views of most leading preterists. I mean, they're getting to be more and more preterists every single day, so it's certainly possible that there are some preterists out there that I don't really know what their views are on Deuteronomy 32. It may be that they haven't published their books. Well. How does Mr. Pope know, then, that they do or do not appeal to Deuteronomy 32? You see the, you see the issue here? So, uh, why dedicate a, a chapter to an examination of Deuteronomy 32 when you say this is not a passage commonly used by preterists? Point of fact is, every leading preterist voice that I know of appeals and appeals strongly to Deuteronomy 32 in the Song of Moses because we believe that it is paradigmatic for understanding biblical eschatology. So, it is really interesting that he begins his discourse by saying, well, I'm going to talk about Deuteronomy 32, although not many preterists appeal to it. Okay, why, why spend your time discussing it, if only, quote, some preterists appeal to it. Who are the some? Well, I'm certainly one of them. I can guarantee you that. So, in, in our response, we're going to be examining a good deal of what Mr. Pope has to say. And, and as I mentioned, what is so interesting is that although Mr. Pope says that not all preterists appeal to Deuteronomy 32, yet he goes on and on and on. He spends a lot of time discussing Deuteronomy 32 and why he rejects it as a prediction of eschatology and at why he rejects it as a prediction of Israel's last days. Now, let me lay the groundwork for what we are going to to discuss. 
Point number one. Mr. Pope says on page 13, a connection between the Song of Moses. Now, mind you, the only Song of Moses that he has referenced up to this point is Deuteronomy 32. So with that in mind, he says, a connection between the Song of Moses and eschatology might be demonstrated by the statement we find in Revelation 15 and 3. Well, in Revelation 15 and 3, we have the Song of Moses and the Lamb. So interestingly enough, Mr. Pope then begins to delineate, pardon me, between the Song of Moses, Exodus chapter 15, the Song of Moses and the Lamb, or the Song of Miriam, the Song of Moses, and <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32. So it, what he's doing is he is pointing out what we have in Revelation are two songs of Moses, and he wants to deny that Deuteronomy 32 is found in Revelation. He wants to deny that Revelation is drawing on Deuteronomy 32 as in its prediction of the day of the Lord. And yet he says a connection between the Song of Moses and eschatology is found in Revelation 15 and verse 3. Well, then that means that Revelation 15 may be related to eschatology. And yet, once again, Mr. Pope tries to divide, bifurcate between Revelation 15, the Song of Moses and the Lamb, and the Song of Moses, which he says is not eschatology. All the while having said there is a connection between the Song of Moses and eschatology might be in Revelation 15. But then, of course, he says Revelation 15 is not the Song of Moses of Deuteronomy 32. It's Exodus 15. But here's the point. It is simply false and wrong. It is exegetically unjustified to divide between the Song of Moses of Deuteronomy 15, uh, excuse me, Exodus 15, Revelation 15, and Deuteronomy 32. And why is that true? Because you see, in Revelation chapter 15, <clears throat> we have the 144,000. The 144,000 are the righteous remnant of the 12 tribes of Israel. As we will see in, in our continuing discussion of the Song of Moses, both Revelation 15 and Revelation or Deuteronomy 32, <clears throat> this is absolutely critical. Because you see, the 144,000, if they are out of the 12 tribes of Israel, which the text in Revelation 7, Revelation 14 emphatically and explicitly says, they are, they are not you see, the church is not the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul said he was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he didn't mean by that the church. So here is a reference to the 144,000 who are the righteous remnant out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, what are the, what are the 144,000 waiting on? Well, Revelation chapter 7 tells us they're waiting to be led to the river of life of Revelation chapter 22, 1 to 3. Then that means that Revelation, in its discussion of the 144,000, now we're not considering for the moment the great multitude that is beside the 144,000, they both receive their salvation at the same time, however, but that's not my point. I'm focused on the 144,000. You got the 144,000, they are the first fruits of those redeemed to God from man, Revelation 14, 2. And they are Jewish Christians. So once again, this means that Revelation in telling us that the 144,000 are waiting to be led to the river of life, that means that Israel was still looking for her salvation 
at the day of the Lord, the judgment and the resurrection of Revelation chapter 20, which means, catch the power of this. Which means, if it's true that the 144,000 were waiting for their salvation, i.e. the river of life, which would only come after the judgment of the judgment, after the day of the Lord, after the resurrection, then that means that Old Covenant Israel, the righteous remnant of Old Covenant Israel, the righteous remnant of the 12 tribes of Israel, who, by the way, are specifically mentioned by name, that means that Old Covenant Israel's salvation history was not terminated at the cross. Yet, one of the most primary, one of the most foundational premise arguments of Mr. Kyle Pope in his book, Thinking About 8070, is that, number one, the law of Moses was annulled, abrogated, and removed at the cross, that God was through with Israel at the cross. Wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. If the righteous remnant of the 12 tribes of Israel, named by name, were still waiting for their salvation at the coming of the Lord, the judgment and the resurrection, then God was most assuredly not through with Israel at the cross. And to conclude this morning, Mr. Pope is simply wrong to bifurcate between Revelation 15 and the Song of Moses and to say, well, Revelation 15 is about, is about Exodus 15 and the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 plays no part in the book of Revelation. Well, as a matter of fact, the book of Revelation, chapter 19, quotes directly and specifically from Deuteronomy 32:43 to, to rejoice in the avenging of the martyrs. Now, here's something you need to understand. Mr. Pope agrees and admits that the New Testament writers, catch this, after the cross, cited and alluded to and applied Deuteronomy 32 to their generation. Now, wait a minute. How is that possible? If God was through with Israel, if the law of Moses was abrogated, annulled, and taken out of the way at the cross as Mr. Kyle Pope affirms repeatedly in his book, then how could it be that the New Testament writers were applying the Song of Moses of Deuteronomy 32 to their day, their time, their generation? And yeah, we're going to have a whole lot more to say about this. And how could Revelation 19 be applying Deuteronomy 32, 43 to that generation? The first century generation. You know, after all, the 144,000 are martyrs who were going to be vindicated at the great day of the Lord. So, yeah, this is very, very difficult for Mr. Pope. On the one hand, to reiterate for emphasis sake, Mr. Pope in his book affirms repeatedly God was through with Israel, God was through with the old covenant at the cross. Yet he admits, he admits that the New Testament writers after the cross were applying Deuteronomy 32 to their day, their time, their ministry. And we're going to prove this over and over and over again, okay? And he agrees and admits that guess what? Revelation 15 was applying Exodus 15. Now, in our next program, I'll show you how he tries to delineate that. And even though he doesn't use these words, evidently he's, evidently, evidently, what he is doing is when he admits that Revelation chapter 15 appeals to Exodus 15 and the Song of Moses there, evidently he takes the position, he, do, he doesn't clarify it here, that, well, uh, John is simply using the language that the song of Miriam, the song of Moses in Exodus 15 was not really prophetic. I would suggest to you that the theme of Exodus 15 is directly parallel with the theme of Deuteronomy 43, 
which is most assuredly being applied to John's generation. There is no bifurcation. There is no dichotomy. There is no division between the Song of Moses, Exodus 15, Revelation 15, and the Song of Moses of Revelation, or excuse me, of Deuteronomy 32 being applied in the book of Revelation. And I'm going to be sharing with you a great deal about the relationship between the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, and the book of Revelation. So, thank you for joining me for this morning's morning musing in video number one in our response and review of Mr. Kyle Pope's book, Thinking About AD 70. Once again, you can get the book at truthbooks.com, which is in uh, Athens, Alabama. Now, I won't be with you next Monday. That's Labor Day. So, please, have a safe, have a happy, have an enjoyable weekend. And I'll see you on Tuesday.